Hello, I am Jessica Hemphill, head digitizer of the SIMS initiatives. We are a digital humanities project at the University of South Carolina Libraries with funding from the Watson Brown Foundation. In celebration of Halloween and to promote our website, we are reading one of William Gilmore Sims' ghost stories throughout the month of October. Grayling, or Murder Will Out, is a part of the author's short story collection, The Wigwam and the Cabin. At this point in the story, the Revolutionary War has recently ended and our hero James Grayling and his family are traveling the treacherous roads of war-torn South Carolina heading to the Low Country. Here now is part three of William Gilmore Sims' Grayling or Murder Will Out. The roads at that season were excessively bad, for the rains of March had been frequent and heavy the track was very much cut up, and the red clay gullies of the hills of 96 were so washed that it required all shoulders 20 times a day to get the wagon wheels out of the bog. This made them travel very slowly, perhaps not more than 15 miles a day. Another cause for slow traveling was the necessity of great caution and a constant lookout for enemies both up and down the road. James and his uncle took it by turns to ride ahead precisely as they had when scouting in war, but one of them always kept along with the wagon. They had gone on this way for two days and saw nothing to trouble and alarm them. There were few persons on the high road, and these seemed to be full as shy of them as they probably were of strangers. But just as they were about to camp the evening of the second day, while they were splitting light wood and getting out the kettles and the frying pan, a person rode up and joined them without much ceremony. He was a short, thick-set man, somewhere between 40 and 50, had on very coarse and common garments, though he rode a fine black horse of remarkable strength and vigor. He was very civil of speech, though he had but little to say, and that little showed him to be a person without much education and with no refinement. He begged permission to make one of the encampment, and his manner was very respectful and even humble. But there was something dark and sullen in his face. His eyes, which were of a light gray color, were very restless, and his nose turned up sharply and was very red. His forehead was excessively broad, and his eyebrows thick and shaggy, white hairs being freely mingled with the dark, both in them and upon his head. Mrs. Grayling did not like this man's looks and whispered her dislike to her son. But James, who felt himself equal to any man, said promptly, What of that, mother? We can't turn the stranger off and say no, and if he means any mischief, there's two of us, you know. The man had no weapons, none at least which were then visible and deported himself in so humble a manner that the prejudice which the party had formed against him when he first appeared, if it was not dissipated while he remained, at least failed to gain any increase. He was very quiet, did not mention an unnecessary word, and seldom permitted his eyes to rest upon any of those in the party, the females not accepted. This, perhaps, was the only circumstance that in the mind of Mrs. Grayling tended to confirm the hostile impression which his coming had originally occasioned. In a little while, the temporary encampment was put in a state both equally social and warlike. The wagon was wheeled a little way into the woods and off the road. The horses fastened behind it in such a manner that any attempt to steal them would be difficult of success, even were the watch neglectful, which was yet to be maintained upon them. Extra guns, concealed in the straw at the bottom of the wagon, were kept well loaded. In the foreground, and between the wagon and the highway, a fire was soon blazing with a wild but cheerful gleam, and the worthy dame, Mrs. Grayling, assisted by the little girl Lucy, lost no time in setting on the frying pan and cutting into slices the haunch of bacon, which they had provided at leaving home. James Grayling patrolled the woods, meanwhile, for a mile or two round the encampment, while his uncle, Joel Sparkman, foot to foot with the stranger seemed, if the absence of all care constitutes the supreme of human felicity, to realize the most perfect conception of mortal happiness. But Joel was very far from being the careless person that he seemed. Like an old soldier, he simply hung out the false colors and concealed his real timidity by an extra show of confidence and courage. 
he did not relish the stranger from the first, any more than his sister, and having subjected him to a searching examination, such as was considered in those days of peril and suspicion, by no means inconsistent with becoming courtesy, he came rapidly to the conclusion that he was no better than he should be. And this has been part three of William Gilmore Sims' Grayling or Murder Will Out. I hope you'll tune in next time for another section of this ghostly tale. And if you'd like to read the full text of this story or any of the other stories of William Gilmore Sims, please visit our website at sims.library.se.edu. Until then, have a happy Halloween.